properly. Um, I invite Veronica Stefan to take over the moderation for the next session and we go directly into the panel. Once again, thank you. Uh, well, good morning. Uh, nice to see you here. Uh, I invite the secretary to join us for the second uh, uh, part of this morning. And then I would also like to welcome on the stage uh, the guests of the first panel. And together with us, we have the ambassador, Tonya Kaiser, uh, if you are uh, kind to join me on the stage. Uh, Georgi Johadze from the Council of Europe also, and Lucien Kaster. Is he around as well? Yeah, please join me on the stage. And we can continue from here. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, I would have to, to announce a small change of the program, I think. Uh, mostly because the moderator that was supposed to join us, it's uh, slightly blocked, I think, because of security changes. So Natalia might join us a little bit later, but for now, I will, uh, I will keep the role of the moderator. I am Veronica Stefan, and I represent Digital Citizens Romania, which is a Romanian think tank working in connecting stakeholders from both Romania and other regions in terms of promoting policies, in terms of ensuring that voices of various stakeholders uh, are taking in uh, policy making. So with that in mind, it is a real pleasure to host uh, this panel today on cybersecurity in Southeastern Europe, especially in a time when Romania holds the presidency of the EU Council. Uh, and in a quite distinguished uh, composition of today with diverse expertise, I'm happy to have representatives from France uh, who have uh, hosted the Global IGF just months ago. Uh, and in a time when we discuss lots of security issues on different fronts, and there are some numbers I would like you to stay with. And since I'm an improvised moderator, <laughs> I can afford to take over just for a second and it is 24,000 malicious mobile apps that are blocked every day right now. And there are about 25,000 cyber crimes that are being reported on average annually for each country. And there are about 12 million euros or US dollars that are being spent for each country to counterattack cyber crimes. So these are just the numbers we report uh, and we are aware of at least right now. So th these are questions that concern probably all of us or none of us. I don't know. This is a question we are here to answer and how we will deal with them. And before starting, I would like to get your opinion, first of all. Is cybersecurity a responsibility for whom? And I would like to invite you to raise up your hands. Is it a responsibility of governments? Yes or no? If it is yes, you can raise your hand. So do, have, do governments have a responsibility for that? No, or yes. Do business sector have a responsibility for that? Do citizens, all of us, have a responsibility for that? Mm, yeah, well, <laughs> we do have a responsibility for that probably, re regardless who we represent. But then uh, here, is, uh, here is the discussion we are going to, to approach today. Uh, I'm going to first give a space for each of our uh, speakers to, to present the, the status uh, of cybersecurity in different sectors from different perspectives. And I would start again with State Secretary Mar uh, Maria Manuela Catrina, also to give us an overview of how Europe is dealing with this. I mean, in the EU, we are already talking about the EU Cybersecurity Act, which is an important framework document, but also in Romania, we have done. I mean, significant steps even uh, weeks <laughs> right now by launching uh, an emergency number for reporting cybersecurity attacks and other uh, initiatives. State Secretary? Uh, thank you very much. Actually, um, I believe uh, we speak a lot about cybersecurity. Um, sometimes we also should do many things in cybersecurity. And I start saying that uh, I strongly believe that behind regulation, that 
it's a government job and we do it. Um, behind, uh, let's say, uh, companies' responsibilities, and many of the companies does uh, uh, keep up with this, um, I strongly believe in education because um, it's a new field. It's something that actually the parents cannot necessarily teach their children. We learned at school to wash our hands uh, at home, but um, definitely uh, in this field maybe the children will teach the parents. And uh, this is so important uh, and I cannot praise enough uh, what you do in your, in your countries. Uh, speaking and working together with the youth because uh, this is a field where definitely we need more engaged people, we meet, need more knowledge knowledge people, we need excellence but also we need um, let's say cyber for, for cyber security but also cyber hygiene. So the field in that we, in that we, we have to work it's, lo it's, uh, it's wide. I um, I would just say, uh, not necessarily answering about uh, implementing the NIST nice directive or working on the European regulation. We work a lot now on, on the Excellence Center in Cybersecurity because <coughs> we strongly believe that uh, Europe should keep up uh, with the rest of the world and uh, should uh, actually be the front runner in, in, uh, in this field. And we need excellence. We need also uh, money invested in this uh, field. And, um, I know from from the let's say from the industry or from from even from government projects sometimes that uh, the first thing you cut in uh, in a project is uh, is the cybersecurity uh, because it's expensive, it's not uh, easy to deal, and many people don't know about it. So at least also many decision makers don't realize that they will, should have this layer of cybersecurity. So uh, one of the things we, we do, despite uh, what, uh, what uh, my colleague uh, from uh, the regulator said before, Edward, is uh, we also um, are quite involved in uh, this 5G strategy, but also the cybersecurity for 5G. That would be a different, a totally different, uh, different environment. And uh, definitely um, in, in other strategies that we work, like, uh, like a smart city strategy, smart city is another buzzword that we know in this type of conference, we are really, really concerned of the cybersecurity layer that, l that should be transversal and um, rely upon uh, any, of the any of the applications, besides interoperability and property of the data and uh, the protection of uh, personal, but also uh, uh, private data, also business data, and so on. And uh, that means uh, cybersecurity is not, not only, as we speak about products, cybersecurity by design, but cybersecurity as a mindset. And that is, would be the, the next step in, the, in this field. I would um, connect this discussion about cybersecurity because I don't know how many of you did, you, uh, did saw uh, the logo of the Romanian presidency. Uh, it's maybe, um, it looks like um, we say a standard of the old Dacians uh, that has a head of the wolf and the tail of the um, of a serpent uh, or to explain it more easier for for the young audience is um, a mix of a Targary a mix of uh, Starks and Targaryens so um, and uh, one of the focuses is uh, one of the the reasons we we chose this logo is also because we believe cybersecurity per se is, is something that is important for, for Europe. And uh, for, for many Romanians, when they think about cybersecurity, they think of this type of, uh, of logo because it's similar also with uh, one of the big Romanian companies that is a leader in cybersecurity. But, um, and the logo was designed by a kid. It was won in a contest, so uh, the explanation about the logo com comes later and even these new, this new connections. So uh, I will stop, but um, not saying much about what we ten intend to do in the future. Uh, beside having uh, IT and uh, coding class uh, classes starting from the fifth grade in every school, uh, that has uh, cyber hygiene curricula in a very, very young age, and we want to get it um, lower, uh, we, we praise the good work with the Ministry of Education, and also this is an, a subject that we praise the good work uh, that we did together with all the NGOs, all the stakeholders, and all the industry. It was a common approach to get this knowledge in the schools. 
and uh, I think we reap, reap the fruits of this in, in a couple of years. So uh, I don't know how, it, uh, how it's in other parts of, of, of Eastern or Southeastern Europe. I also strongly believe in cooperation. I know our certs, for example, work very well together. And uh, we, we do a lot of capacity building through the certs in, in the area. Uh, because uh, cybersecurity doesn't stop on the border. It's something transversal. And uh, we should work together in uh, keeping this uh, space uh, that has no physical border anymore. Uh, as secure as we, we can. Thank you. Thank you for highlighting the, the borderless aspect of internet and cybersecurity in general, and especially the digital literacy part, because wherever we look, either it's about uh, national security, either it's about competencies, either it's about the way we use online tours as a business or citizens, whatever we do, the life uh, through social media, everything is connected with cybersecurity and it is everything borderless. So somehow the solutions probably should be common and then it would be a point that we can uh, later tackle on. Uh, I will move to a different perspective now, going to more Central Europe, uh, to Ambassador Kaiser. Ambassador Kaiser is representing here the Ministry of Foreign Affairs from Slovenia. Uh, he has been an ambassador to Denmark until last year with a responsibility for the entire Nordic countries. And I think he has learned a lot from the ambassador for, uh, for digital agenda over there as well. And he has took some responsibility on that as well in Slovenia. Ambassador. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's a great honor uh, being a representative of a government, uh, showing also the, the importance uh, governments are paying to initiatives like CIDIC uh, for Southeast Europe uh, to be actively part of this multi-stakeholder. Everybody is now putting forward that we need a multi-stakeholder approach. It's not only the responsibility of the governments, it's, it's actually a bit of a paradox because uh, cybersecurity it's inevitably part of uh, overall security uh, national security and uh, it used to be that the governments had the mandate to secure a, a, a environment for the citizens to make the environment safe but in this case it's uh, inevitably true that uh, governments can't do all the job so we have to work together uh, I was uh, following not directly the, the digital and, and cyber agenda when I was working in the Nordic countries. I had a broader mandate. Uh, I was um, uh, posted to Denmark, but since we are having limited resources, I was covering the whole Nordic region. Uh, <clears throat> and as you know, the Nordics, they are very advanced, uh, obviously also in the digital uh, domain. So they are, they are actually in the, in the leading uh, role uh, at the EU level. But uh, there is a... Um, important thing uh, to mention here, that the digital transformation to, to make a secure a digital environment for, uh, for growing the digital economy, you need to have also a secure uh, cyberspace. So uh, narrowing uh, uh, down or ironing out the differences between the, the level of uh, digital transformation development and uh, cybersecurity uh, level it, it's very important, so I was following this. When I came back uh, last year to, to back to my capital, I was asking the foreign ministry to take over the role as a coordinator for digital agenda, which is embracing, it's actually one coin, I would say, with the two sides. Digital transformation, to make a secure digital transformation, you cannot make it without a, a, a proper uh, um, cyber security. So I'm concentrating now to work together uh, with, with the different uh, departments because obviously it's a horizontal matter. It's, it's uh, uh, reaching from the local level uh, to the global level. So within the foreign ministry we have a joint team, we have uh, established now a cyber domain and we are also working with, with our line ministries. We have a, a ministry for public administration. In Slovenia, I have to say we are quite good, doing very well in the, in the uh, digital transformation uh, following the, the DESI index, which is measuring the digital uh, uh, development of the EU member states. We are somewhere in the middle and uh, we are continuing. And uh, what I would like to, uh, to mention here that uh, uh, recently, you know all the developments and the State Secretary has mentioned what is going on at the EU level. Uh, <coughs> 
but besides of our internal exercise, we are making uh, cybersecurity as an important part of integral EU policies. Uh, we are also strengthening the dialogue. Uh, so the EU cyber dialogue platform was established, and uh, I would see here uh, also the opportunity to bring the CIDIC on board uh, as a partner in this dialogue, uh, uh, so that uh, maybe in the in the in the month to come uh, we could do something. I will give an initiative at the EU level because the 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 regional cooperation uh, 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 platforms are very important in this process of making the internet open, secure for all and functioning. I'll, I'll stop here at, 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 at this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are talking probably due to our speakers and our expertise about the EU, but then of course the goal is to expand it because the region it's not only EU and the cooperation is not EU only anyway. That was the principle we started from since it's borderless. Uh, but it's good to mention that uh, the ambassador highlighted the DESTI, DESTI uh, Digital Economy and Society Index, which is created annually by the European Union. European Union being currently the biggest digital market that exists, about 500 million users, so at least it's a good potential. But to be honest, about half of this population doesn't have the basic digital skills. So this goes always back back to education, what we can do for everyone. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, moving on from this EU towards more uh, broader perspective, I'm going to our next speaker, um, uh, Georgi Johaze. He's representing here the Council of Europe. He's based in uh, Bucharest, actually, uh, working a cybercrime program office responsible for the uh, regional countries for the Eastern Partnership in principle. Georgi, how, how do you see things from the Council of Europe perspective? Um, uh, thank you very much, Veronica, but also many thanks to Serene and to CDIC team for uh, giving us an opportunity to, to be here, not just to speak, but also to support uh, the organization of this uh, important event because it's easy for us to do. We're based in Bucharest. Uh, the Cybercrime Program Office is mostly working on capacity building programs, not just in the Eastern Partnership, but uh, across the whole globe, so which gives us a bit more perspective when it comes to international cooperation. But uh, I think that the challenges of cooperation that you mentioned and going beyond the regions and going beyond the borders are fairly common across the whole world. They are different maybe from region to region, probably the EU being more integrated than the others, but I think nevertheless they are most the same. And uh, to put this into context, I think we need to draw the line also between the cybercrime and cybersecurity. Um, sometimes we refer to them as two sides of the same coin which was uh, also uh, brought in here by one of the speakers, but basically when it comes to the problems of, cyber, of security of cyberspace and incidents happening there, you can respond to them in two ways. One is to deal with it through cybersecurity response, which is mostly the certs or the information security officers or basically the industry-based response, and the other would be also to respond to the same incident in the criminal justice ways. So the criminal justice tools that are available for the security of cyberspace. And I think when it comes to cybercrime, it's fairly clear that it's government's responsibility. There is no question about it. It's not just me saying this, but also uh, the authority of the Council of Europe, which is the European Court of Human Rights, uh, which in the case of KU versus Finland established the principle that it's a positive obligation of every member state of the Council of Europe to ensure security of citizens in cyberspace through criminal justice response to cybercrime. So it's fairly clear, it's fairly, uh, I mean, it's also quite a conservative view of, of, the, of the matter because, again, the criminal justice is the responsibility of the state and thus ensuring criminal justice in cyberspace is also by extension responsibility of the state. Uh, however, when it comes to international cooperation, uh, I think the context is also quite important here because when we speak about the context, we have to think also about uh, not just uh, simply the criminal justice, but mm -hmm. the environment in which uh, the states operate and the states need to cooperate. So uh, when it comes to international cooperation, the multiple choices exist there, the multiple tools exist there. You can go through the police-to-police -police cooperation, for example, one of the tools being, for example, 24-7 points of contact network created under the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime, or the Interpol network, or the EU, Europol-based uh, Siena network, or you can go through the other sources, like, for example, uh, G7, 24-7 points of contact. So when it comes to police-to-police -to -police cooperation, it happens on a more informal level. 
And the informal level is important because then the information is exchanged in real time and actually some incidents are being dealt with quite effectively because of the informal nature of the network. But when it comes to formal cooperation to the mutual legal assistance, uh, there is quite a lot of use that we're still using the 19th century tools to deal with the 21st century problem. It, this is especially acute in cybercrime because the mutual legal assistance process, the formal assistance between judiciaries, prosecution offices, Ministry of Justice is slow, is inefficient, is sometimes settled with political debate, and uh, sometimes the responses are very easy to sort of decline the positive responses due to political reasons, humanitarian reasons. So I would say that the international cooperation in this regard needs quite a lot of improvement. Uh, but the good news is that uh, recently, especially at the European level, uh, when it comes to the EU, and I would specifically refer to the EU evidence proposals that try to create also additional uh, uh, tools and opportunities for international cooperation, but I would like to also note something in a wider context, uh, not just going, going also beyond the EU and going also to the Southeast of Europe. We also have the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime that I mentioned, the Council of Europe Convention on Cybercrime, to which I think all of the states of Southeastern Europe are members uh, at the moment, uh, members too. And uh, at the same time, there is a work ongoing at the Cybercrime Convention Committee in Strasbourg to modernize the convention through the additional protocol to the convention, the second additional protocol, which will be actually the text of which will be finalized this year. And it looks specifically into international cooperation aspects. It looks into how to improve it, how to modernize it, how to make it more efficient how to make it easier for the states to exchange data electronically, to exchange them in one format, in one language. So these are those issues that are going to speed up significantly uh, the mutual legal assistance if it's going to be adopted. And uh, I think that uh, we're looking at a fairly uh, bright future from there. I'm cautiously optimistic, of course, because adoption of a treaty is one thing, implementation of it is another, and sometimes it is a problem of implementing the law and actually, uh, but still, I think the tools will be there to, to not to deal anymore with the 21st century problem with 19th uh, century tools. So sure. that's, that's my take on down. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Georgi. And I thank you for highlighting the different roles, because it's good to say that all of us have a responsibility, but there are frameworks and there are different responsibilities sometimes and different mechanisms for intervention or prevention for that matter. And I think it's important for all of us to be aware of them, but also to use these mechanisms, because they are just as valuable as we as citizens or other interest stakeholders actually make uh, the best of them. Uh, well, we have mentioned the EU Cybersecurity Act, the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime, but then there is another, uh, since we, we are going to the next guest, there is another uh, call out there for cybersecurity strengthening, and that is the Paris call uh, for trust and security in the cyberspace that has been launched during the IGF in France last year, launched by the very President Macron uh, during the conference, and I'm happy to introduce with this the next speaker here, Lucien Castel, he's a researcher at the University of Sorbonne. Uh, in Paris, France. Uh, he has been also recently, quite recently, appointed to the multi-stakeholder advisory group uh, by the UN Secretary General. He is engaged in different uh, internet societies in, uh, in France as well. So, Lucien, what is your take on this, as both as a researcher and an international expert on the topic? Thank you. I would like first a quick word on thanking you for inviting me at CIDIG. It's quite interesting uh, to be there from a French perspective, obviously, and to be able to reflect on global topics. So indeed, uh, the Paris Rule uh, was uh, published and pushed forward in November last year by President Emmanuel Macron. And as of April this year, there is over 500 signatories. So it's, it's quite a lot. And the aim is to try restoring trust and security in cyberspace, which, as you already said, is quite difficult. It's quite a, 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 it's quite a challenge, really. So it launched at the last Internet Governance Forum in Paris, which is a sign of, um, of so, some sort of tangible outcome uh, coming of the IGF and the, the need to implement uh, tangible policies at the global level to tackle cybersecurity. Uh, in the broader sense, I mean cybersecurity, obviously cyber threat, but also concerns uh, about privacy, concerns about trust in general, IoT, big data, and so on, as it was mentioned during the introductory speeches. 
uh, say the, um, the Paris School basically uh, want to build protection and resilience for internet and uh, to protect access and integrity of internet. Basically, uh, it's a need to increase cooperation between actors and not only state actors, but it was, it, it was stressed out earlier, between all stakeholders involved, meaning mm -hmm. government, but also civil society, technical community, uh, academia, uh, working together yes. towards a collaborative security. So, such a collaborative security is quite oh, important so for a short in the context of the kind of yes. election. We are in the process, I hope, yes. obviously. Uh, of I the mean, European election yeah, and one of the yeah one of the key points of the Paris School sure was just uh, preventing interference okay, in electoral the processes system. and that's so, quite a concern uh, in France and obviously at a broader mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. um, okay, the third concern go was go the security go of all digital uh, products uh, and services, uh, meaning obviously. Uh, computers and terminals that we use every day, IoT devices uh, coming forward. And as my colleague said earlier, we need uh, an improved cyber hygiene to have civil society, but also any user uh, participate actively in bringing cyber security. So, um, last point, um, the Paris School tried to stress out the need to work towards the international standard to build the framework a bit in a sense, um, as it was said a minute ago, of the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime to really implement an effective way uh, to make it safer to navigate internet. So, it's an effort, it's a kind of digital cooperation for increase responsibility and I may say for capacity building. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Well, we have touched on uh, a lot of things and I take here uh, the underlining of the trust part, the resilience, the hygiene and the rights part and I think I'd like to go towards this um, this topic as well because we are talking about all these frameworks and now it's a strong debate because so far probably, and I sometimes say that without or <laughs> without uh, being in my right to say it, but technology has happened to us. We were not in a space where we actually understood technology and then created technology. On the contrary, technology happened and now we are just adjusting to it. And maybe we are also used to create frameworks without always understanding what's happening. And I'm not saying, and I'm not sure if they work or they know, they don't. We will see about that in years and in time, but what, what is the challenge of that? How is um, the cyber world and the uh, frameworks that are being created affecting the rights as well? Because they are being redefined in a way, and in a way, in written as well. So I can leave this open to, to the panelists to react. And also, I will be looking in the room for uh, reactions. So in case you want to prepare your questions or uh, your reflections on the topics, please do that. And we can take them in the next round. Who would like to, to, to tackle the, the rights dimension and the possible, I don't know, challenges created by different frameworks? Yeah, thank you. I think you have touched upon a very important thing because internet as an open space should also take into consideration the basic rights, human rights. Um, as we are maybe not all, but uh, quite a lot of us uh, aware that uh, we have to ensure the same level of the human rights uh, 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 respect in the cyberspace as in the physical space. So now for uh, uh, quite a few years uh, there is a, uh, um, it's a initiative uh, actually uh, uh, going on very well. It's uh, human rights online. Um, governments are uh, uh, increasingly taking very active part uh, in it. Uh, last year there was a, a conference, uh, uh, human rights online uh, in Germany. So here it's, it's very important forum uh, to, to give this message that uh, human rights, the, 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 the respect of, of privacy and, and all those values uh, which our societies uh, uh, in Europe uh, are, are built uh, upon should be actively uh, uh, transmitted to the cyberspace. And the same goes with, uh, with the international law. 
which is fully valid. We are now having uh, intensive discussions at the, at the UN level. You know that there are two uh, parallel processes. Uh, and uh, here I think we have to stick together and to, to defend uh, those, those basic rights not to be violated so that internet will, will stay open and all the users will have the equal opportunities with, with, the, with the protection of, of, of their rights. Th th this would be uh, my comment on this. Thank you. Uh, if I may as well, uh, representing the Council of Europe, which is an organization based on human rights and the rule of law, so it's our bread and butter as an organization, I can say. Uh, we are paying the, 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 the attention to the issue, of course, quite extensively because, again, I mentioned that, for example, when it comes to actually fight against cybercrime itself, it's a reflection of the right of every citizen to be secure in cyberspace. So this whole concept is actually based on human rights as well as criminal justice. Because if you look at criminal justice and its development, basically it's been based on the recognition of the rights of the victim, of the suspect, against the state in terms of having more and more rights every year, and uh, basically just developed there also uh, in, in, in cybercrime investigations as well. But that is not the point that I want to highlight today because I think there's been already quite a lot said there uh, by different people, uh, more knowledgeable than I am on that. But I would like to focus on the aspect of trust as well that you mentioned. And uh, we believe that having trust is as important as keeping with your obligations to protect human rights. And let me illustrate it by two examples uh, that we had in the Eastern Partnership. In one of the countries, we had uh, quite a lot of discussion uh, with the government and the internet industry uh, that I would say hated each other with passion. And when it came especially to cooperation on the access to data. And for many years, I think more than 10 years, we tried quite, I mean, quite a lot, but also quite fruitlessly to bring them to dialogue and to sort of, to put the start to legislative developments that would tackle the problem, for example, of access to data, that they could enter into a memorandum of cooperation as well, which is more informal way to, to deal with it. And I would say that there was some progress, but it was not enough. And then one day everything changed. And that one day was when that specific country had received one of the largest cyber attacks in history, actually practically paralyzing its private sector and the internet industry. But so this is when the industry turned to the help to the government, and the government also turned to the industry and they started to cooperate. And from there, everything fell into place. So sometimes I just want to illustrate that sometimes we have the best intentions, but the conditions have to be right, and the trust has to be right. So the trust was there once it was a common interest to protect the security of the government, of the business, and of the citizens in cyberspace based on extreme circumstances. The second example in another Eastern Partnership country in which I'm working, so it's comfortable for me to speak about those examples, is that there was an agreement and trust, I would say, between the government and between the law enforcement in terms of uh, access to data. The security and law enforcement services process data based on memorandum of cooperation and the law. Uh, the internet industry has agreed to give the full control to the government, so sort of basically they saved the costs. But of course, users were not happy because there was no oversight in terms of effective oversight in terms of how the, the, this data was being accessed. And then suddenly one day they were slapped with a constitutional court judgment which said abolish the whole system. It's not right, so it should not be the security services processing the data in that regard. And also it has to be limited severely. So they had to rebuild the whole system and introduce some very exotic decisions like, for example, date protection commissioner and not the judge standing in the middle of interceptions and standing in the middle of anything that was happening between the law enforcement in cyberspace against or against the citizens being the interception, monitoring of data, or any other uh, thing that was happening there. So, and it was quite costly, and uh, it was quite costly also politically to, to, to the government. So I would like to say that uh, sometimes the reality is really uh, bringing up the other things than just uh, uh, the regular frameworks of human rights in cyberspace. Or, uh, but I think that trust is equally important as well. This is what I'm trying to, to say. Thank you. It's always hard to be the last to speak <laughs> on such matter. Well, obviously, uh, applicability of uh, international law, uh, humanitarian law, and human rights in cyberspace is a must. Um, and obviously, France has a strategy in this regard, basically at the French level, to reflect a bit on, on uh, my colleague's comments. Uh, we have a national cybersecurity cyber strategy and uh, a cyber defense model. 
uh, stressing out the importance of protecting sensitive activities from cyber threats broadly. So uh, we aim towards uh, a European harmonization in this regard, as obviously uh, in the Council of Europe and at U European uh, Commission level. And uh, we have uh, a lot of concerns about data security and data breaches, uh, in particular as, as it concerns a notification of breaches. So uh, in this regard, uh, the GDPR enacted uh, lately and the French legislation uh, is applying to the processing, to the storage of data. Uh, and the French Data Protection Authority, the CNIL, Commission Nationale Informatique et Liberté, uh, requires data controller to undertake systemic uh, skills and risk assessment before processing any data. Also, uh, it was mentioned earlier, the, the NIS directive uh, has been transposed in France uh, last year, 25 of May, and is quite important because uh, it's, a playing, it's implying a national framework, the need of computer security incident response teams, and mostly cooperation at the U European and global levels between authorities, uh, obviously between experts. And the collaboration <coughs> basically is essential to build a real collaborative cyber security. So in France, <laughs> We, also, uh, we are also developing uh, a model as it concerns, I'd say, content regulation, but it's really bordering cybersecurity. Um, we have a law uh, regarding identity theft. Uh, we had laws in the past 10 years, uh, mainly on willful and obviously unauthorized access to data systems. And uh, we passed last year a law on fake news, on disinformation, to try to tackle, obviously, this broader problem. And being discussed uh, no day in Parliament, we have a, 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 we have a bill, uh, I'd say, on hate speech, also to try to tackle hate speech online, which is quite complex, obviously, and to try to collaborate with platform, with government, and with civil society. The main problem, really, uh, that I could stress out is that cyber security, regula regulating cyber security, and uh, obviously regulating content, might uh, pose a problem with regard to fragmentation of the internet. And that's quite a problem. Thank you. Thank you. I'll uh, be looking in the room if there are reactions or uh, reflections or questions. And please don't be shy. I mean, this is the space to, to interact. There is no point to... Also, I would like to mention, in case Torina didn't highlight it very well, we do have a youth school CED, so we have a very young generation interested in internet governance here, so I will also very much welcome their interventions during this day. I had the hand in the back. Uh, yeah? Uh, we need the mic there. I could show. Name Hello. and organization as well, please. Hello, I'm Gabriel Pala. I'm a freelance consultant. I have proofs, uh, electronic proofs, that the UK Ministry of Defense is intercepting email. And I also have electronic proof that Microsoft is collaborating with them. I did report it to the UK government and to the Investigative Powers Tribunal, which is supposed to be overseeing the investigative services in the UK. They did not uh, dispute my uh, proofs, but they said, it did not have any chance of succeeding if they did take it to court, meaning that the courts in the UK would um, basically cover up the issue. I did report it to the uh, European Commission and other OLAF and other organizations. There's been no reaction. So, at a sort of discourse level, we have a good discourse, human rights protection, privacy and all that. But behind all this, governments just do whatever they want. So how do we tackle that? That's the question. Thank you. Uh, are there hands or reactions in the front? There is uh, first here, please. Yeah.
Uh, hi, okay. Uh, we have one online participation. It's uh, Vladimir Adunovic from Diplo Foundation in Serbia. Uh, the question is directed to Ambassador uh, Kaiser. Higher, higher uh, involvement of diplomats, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in general and in the region in cybersecurity discussions is very important to avoid misunderstandings and poli uh, possible political escalations of cyber attacks, particularly in, in our region, which is prone to uh, political escalations. Thus, far only a handful of countries in uh, Southeastern South Europe have individuals and let alone departments uh, within uh, MFA following uh, cyber issues. And there is almost no regional cooperation on this issue on diplomatic level. We might need to develop capacities uh, of uh, MFAs for cyber issues. What could be the venues to use in Southeastern Europe existing regional uh, and sub-regional cooperation mechanisms? Can you elaborate more uh, on a EU cyber uh, dialogue that you mentioned and how Southeastern Europe uh, PN countries including CDIC uh, could play uh, a role? Okay, I suggest to answer these two and then come back to more reactions and questions. Uh, so we have a very specific question for Ambassador um, Kaiser, uh, but then we also have a bigger question related to what rights actually citizens have and how can they access their rights in relation to governments and what is the real power or hidden power of governments in this um, new technology world. Ambassador, would you like to start with answering this Yeah, thank question? you so much. Thank you for, for your comment, for your observation. I, I agree with you that there is a, is a deficit of, of, of cooperation in, at this level, diplomatic level in the region. So, as it was a deficit at the EU level, I have mentioned this EU cyber dialogue is in place for a, a year, not more. Uh, there is a need for, for more uh, it's also a, a, a trust building uh, between the between the uh, at the government level in this case and uh, at, at, at the other level. So uh, I, I have mentioned before that uh, well, some of the southeastern European countries are in the uh, EU pipeline process, uh, being uh, uh, EU uh, uh, I mean candidates for the EU membership. Uh, they have. Uh, direct access to the IPA, to this instru in instrument for pre-accession. I have uh, spoken with the commission last time and they said, of course, uh, digitalization, cybersecurity, it's, it's not directly a part of the negotiating process, but it is built in. Uh, so they have the possibility to raise this question within the, within the process. But for, for other countries, I, I would say there is a, 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 a necessity uh, to, to approach, and maybe uh, CIDIC can also play as an intermediate in, in, in this case to give a, a signal, uh, and I will mention this uh, at, at the next meeting of the EU Cyber Dialogue, that there is an interest uh, uh, for, 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 uh, for interaction and to exchange of, of, of uh, good practices, because as I said, uh, at the EU level, uh, uh, there, is a, there is a strong commitment that that region has to uh, uh, have a good uh, internet governance, has to have uh, all those elements which are making the societies functional, uh, uh, free and open uh, at, at uh, EU-based ba values uh, to continue in the, in the digital era. So uh, I, I welcome this and uh, let's, let's stay in touch. I will, I will do what I can do uh, at my level to give this, uh, to pass the message uh, uh, to the EU cyber dialogue and uh, then the institutions, the foreign ministries from, from the region should also have their own <coughs> proactive approach. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, who would like to react on the other? Luciano, would you like to start now? Or? Yeah? Sure, sure. Okay. sure. Well, I'd like to second, obviously, Ambassador Kaiser remarks on collaboration. We indeed need improved collaboration, and the, the IGF could be a way uh, of collaborating at the global level, obviously, as Chengadai said earlier, uh, in Berlin next November, CIDIG at the regional level, and all other national and regional initiatives could play a key role in, uh, obviously, bringing forward new policy questions, new problems, and trying to bring them to the national level, to the regional level, and to the global level to try tackling the 
such kind of digital issues and empowering uh, citizens and users uh, as it concerns, obviously, digital regulation. Uh, also, um, collaboration could also mean building multi-stakeholder groups uh, at different levels in France, for example, under the umbrella, uh, under the umbrella of the Internet Society. Uh, we put together uh, a working group on the security of the Internet of Things, which is bringing actors from government, for example, the telecom regulator RCEP or the cybersecurity agency ANSI, with the technical community, obviously, uh, ethnic, internet society, academia also, and civil society. So it's quite uh, interesting to be able to collaborate in such a multi-stakeholder fashion. Also, uh, Internet Society uh, just launched an IoT security policy platform to try to coordinate and to promote a global uh, effort to build best practices as it concerns IoT security. It's on yet another way to, to cooperate and to, to empower uh, citizens, government, and a multi-stakeholder multi way of collaboration which promotes uh, citizen partnership. Okay. Um, I would like to respond to the difficult question from a gentleman about uh, the, what uh, powers do a government have actually, some, maybe some hidden powers in there. I think that the answer to this question would also depend on the context, whether, for example, you're, what we are referring to is the cybersecurity matter or the cybercrime matter, so what was the context. But irrespective of this, I should mention that, yes, I mean, the putting too much trust in, in, the, in the traditional institutions, let's say even in the criminal justice sometimes is a bad idea. And the second example that I brought in my previous uh, uh, intervention in one of the Eastern Partnership countries when there was a constitutional court judgment actually saying that the whole system is wrong, uh, the solution to this was actually not to empower the judiciary, which is usually the traditional one which oversees the criminal justice, the investigations, ensures rights of the suspects. I mean, it's the ultimate sort of instance in there. Not, not to do that, but to empower the debt protection uh, uh, authority and to empower them in a most exotic way, giving them direct access to the technology to oversee and to stop any interception, interception that they deem uh, as, as illegal. Because one thing is that uh, the judiciary, let's say, approves the motion from, from the law enforcement, and second is how this, how this motion is being implemented. Because it can be implemented in a way that will be contrary to the spirit of the judgment, to the spirit of the, of the um, court decision, let's say, and, and, and the differences, and the devil is also in the details in there. Uh, what I'm trying to say is not to undermine the traditional, of course, role of a judiciary in there. But sometimes it's not enough because it's limited maybe in terms of also technology and continuous oversight. Because it's one thing to approve, let's say, or to say that the specific evidence is admissible in a criminal case and the way how this evidence was processed before and for example if there was any violation of rights in their right to privacy for example would be the first one on the second level i would be more optimistic if it came to of course the uh, criminal justice system because first of all it's more regulated there is more red tape to cut but also uh, if uh, the state you're referring to is a member to the council of europe obviously it is then, of course, there is also a remedy to move up to, let's say, the, the, the institutions that are uh, above, above the governments. For example, the European Court of Human Rights have legislated quite a lot and had quite a case law also on the protection of rights in cyberspace. So I think this is the, the, all the remedies are not lost at the level of the government. So the governments are not responsible only before their citizens, but also before the international community as such and before the, 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 the court, if I could say, in, at least in the Council of Europe system. But Again, that's not an easy that's not an easy solution and easy answer to a difficult question as well. It's just pointing that solutions may be coming from the angles that we don't expect and not sought, I mean, in the traditional ways and setups of the criminal justice system. So. Uh, thank you. If there are no other reactions in the panel, then we move uh, to the room again. We had the question or remark in the front, and then if there is another. Name an organization, please. Maybe? Yes. yes. Thank you. So my name is Christian Bulumak. I work in the European Parliament for the Green CFA Group. Uh, my question is related to the new wave of devices which, which connects to the Internet. Network operators and governments are providing better and faster networks. Um, we connect mobile phones. It's a totally new class of devices. And we have another category of stakeholders, the people who own the app stores. 
but we are preparing for a totally new class. We are preparing for coffee makers, uh, baby monitors, dolls, and cars, which are increasingly uh, providing new security risks. And those type of devices have to be assessed from the point of what's happening with them. We currently have a post factum market access. We have a case in Germany where a doll was withdrawn from the market because it had no security features, but we have no regulatory framework to prevent these cases ha from happening. So I would launch the discussion on how should we proceed, how we should prevent that this wave of millions of devices will kind of break the current way of functioning. Is it a minimal basic requirement for security uh, as a regulatory remedy, or maybe is any kind of other remedy? Thank you. There is also a question or a comment from the online, I think. No? Please, please. Hi, uh, my name is Natalia, and I am the cause for your uh, moderation this uh, this morning. I uh, would like to apologize for the uh, for being late to the session due to some uh, accidents uh, on the plane um, back in Moscow and uh, postponing some of my flights. And um, First of all, I would like to thank you so much, uh, Veronica, for taking over and doing a great job uh, in, in moderating the session. But it also adds to the dialogue uh, that we're having here today. I would like to bring the uh, voice of the technical organizations that I'm uh, personally representing, uh, coming from ICANN. Um, and uh, Chad, uh, some thoughts on uh, security uh, um, on importance to raise security on and cooperative efforts that uh, that were mentioned uh, uh, here by by all the uh, panelists. Um, so why why are we having this discussion at all? Because uh, uh, internet uh, grew into a vast uh, tool that we widely use uh, on our daily basis. And it's not just uh, uh, playing, uh, you know, games online. It's it's e-commerce. It's getting electronic services from government. It's uh, uh, getting our our passports. Uh, it's uh, uh, traveling, uh, ordering online, and so on and so forth. And and the base of this uh, uh, of of this uh, huge uh, structure. Uh, are some core internet identifiers, one of which is uh, DNS, that I can, uh, is, uh, um, uh, is, uh, I can is responsible for, and the, the mission that I can uh, uh, strive to achieve is to ensure secure and uh, stable and resilient functioning of the, of the DNS. Uh, I can itself uh, understands uh, um, understands the, the importance of security and that it's impossible for just one actor uh, to ensure it. We have to indeed work cooperatively between technical organizations, uh, uh, standard setting organizations, as well as businesses, internet service providers, uh, root service operators, uh, and governments uh, that are the ones responsible to set policies. Um, I can uh, follow closely the uh, information about uh, DNS attacks as uh, uh, we're seeing the risks of uh, um, growing attacks on the basic DNS infrastructure. Uh, and um, uh, we issue um, announcements with specific recommendations on uh, uh, ensuring DNS security. But besides that, ICANN itself tries to uh, show its transparency and openness to uh, tackling security issues that ICANN systems face. And uh, uh, we uh, also um, published the, uh, uh, a security incident log uh, with some security transparency guidelines, which would uh, which would, would report on the uh, attacks or on the threats uh, on ICANN systems itself, uh, and how we uh, handle and overcome this uh, these threats. Uh, so, to add to the uh, call for coordination and cooperation between uh, various organizations, uh, just to state that ICANN uh, uh, has. Um, uh, opened uh, is is open for uh, stronger dialogue with governments uh, and with uh, standard developing organizations. Uh, we've uh, published recently uh, 
um, a vision on, on ICANN's approach towards uh, uh, more in improved or engaged uh, uh, cooperation with governments and we would uh, uh, call governments and other uh, organizations that are uh, involved in, in the security uh, endeavors to, uh, to engage with technical organizations, the ones that are uh, dealing with the basic uh, internet infrastructure that would uh, enhance security uh, uh, of the whole internet. And um, as by saying that, I uh, would like to, s to extend my, uh, my deepest thanks uh, to you once again uh, uh, for, uh, for making this session uh, a successful uh, uh, dialogue. Thank you, Veronica. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Natalia. Thank you for completing the picture. Actually, we were missing the technical community in this panel. We had decision makers, uh, international experts, international organizations, but we were really missing this one. And thank you for uh, adding this, but maybe we can also even reflect on that because infrastructure and DNS, it's really critical. We also have an intervention from the online community, and then we go back to the reflections and comments from the panel also in relation to the first uh, question, please. Uh, okay, so we have two comments. One is from Christina, the uh, ambassador from Armenia. Uh, she says, I think we are starting to understand that cybersecurity is not just a matter of IT, uh, not even of uh, the government as a whole, but is a, a general social problem. So the first steps to prevent cyber crimes should start from teaching from uh, very young ages. Uh, and then we have uh, a comment from uh, Vladimir from Diplo Foundation in Serbia. Uh, and he says, suggestion, another very relevant international multi-stakeholder forum on cybersecurity is the Global Forum Cyber Expertise. This forum con connects over 50 countries and regional organizations with some 40 global companies and other stakeholders and focuses on practical good practices on cyber di uh, diplomacy, strategies, certs, critical infrastructure protection, cybersecurity, uh, cybersecurity standards, capacity building, and uh, awareness. From our region, Romania is very active, so is uh, Hungary, while uh, Serbia has, ju has just joined and Turkey is uh, passive. Uh, others are missing. I encourage you, both governments and other stakeholders, to explore more uh, opportunities with this, uh, within this forum and some good practices already uh, available. On my end, I will try to uh, better link seeding with uh, uh, this forum's uh, deliberations. Okay, thank you. So I'll just remind you of the first comment that was related to more prevention measures or what other kind of measures can be taken since in this uh, Internet of Things, uh, things uh, move in a way we didn't expect, we didn't know how to, to address before. Reflections, <laughs> comments. Ambassador. Well, I'll try to be quick on, on this question. Well. Uh, I mentioned IoT a bit earlier, so uh, obviously uh, it's quite a growing problem because there's a number of new objects connecting every day and obviously that's uh, most, uh, mostly a security problem. Uh, so what can we do? Uh, reflecting also on the, on, on the questions from the audience online, education is of paramount importance because people don't really know uh, what is IoT. Uh, how it works and even how it connects uh, to the internet. So uh, education uh, as at a very young age and throughout uh, your life is quite an important uh, process. Also um, collaboration uh, in the IoT perspective means that you need to bring the industry to the table to build good practices and recommendation easily implementable at industry level uh, with obviously everyone at the table, government, civil society and so on. So products, s s products selling to, to consumers are secured, making it globally secure for the internet. IoT, but also globally at the internet level. Yeah, may, may I, uh, I fully agree this, this is uh, relevant, but uh, as, as a part of a uh, uh, European, uh, uh, so, so to say, uh, uh, framework uh, in, in, in uh, addressing the, the cyber threats regarding the Internet of Things, 
I would I would remind that this was already a part of the reform package which was which was uh, uh, introduced in 2017 by the European Con Commission through the uh, NIS initiative uh, dire directive and uh, it's it's also addressing uh, uh, EU-wide cybersecurity certification scheme, and uh, as, as far as I'm informed, uh, it's not obligatory, it's uh, voluntary, uh, but it's going to be, I, I spoke last time with the uh, Vice President of the European Commission, uh, Andros Ansip, uh, who was a former Prime Minister of Estonia, he said that for sure the new commission uh, coming into the shoes of, of, of the outgoing commission will have to to uh, pay a really high uh, priority to, uh, to the um, security of the supply chain, uh, because this is very important to keep the, to keep the confidence uh, of, 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 the, of the users, uh, uh, because as, as you said, people uh, uh, are not aware of, of all the potentially risk, or of, of course also benefits. Uh, uh, through Internet of Things, but but uh, predominantly the risk. So this certification scheme is is, is very important. Uh, thank you very much. I think you've covered most of it. So I'll just add, of course, security by design is is, is important. But having spent sizable amount of time, not just in criminal justice, but also with the National Cert before joining the Council of Europe, uh, National Cert of Georgia, is I think the the answers that those guys would give, not myself, would be to be prepared. Uh, and I can, I can give an example. For example, we have the, one of the experts whom we frequently use in capacity building around the world who starts his introduction by saying, like, he's dealt with cybercrime investigations since 1986. And the technology has changed, I mean, almost on a, if not on a yearly basis, at least on two or three years. So whatever threats were applicable at the time, in 90s, in the beginning of 2000, et cetera, are totally irrelevant right now, and the new threats are totally different from the others. So. Uh, I don't think that we can stop technology in some ways from entering because it will find the way and the progress will find the way, but to be prepared in terms of capacities to deal with it, to deal with the threats, is as important as building the prevention. So this is why I think that our work as a group is also important because we just contribute directly uh, from the office in Bucharest to, to those capacities, especially in the law enforcement. So that would be my take on it. Thank you. Well while I still will look in the room and I see Liana in the back. Uh, I will also uh, dare to comment just a little bit from a civil society perspective. And I know, for example, that the EU is doing a lot in this regard. And you, as you, a person involved in the European Parliament, you know already the fact that they already highly highlighted the importance of ethics and trust in artificial intelligence. I think it's an important milestone. I think at some point we'll have to look how much of these debates are just following very slowly and sometimes too slowly what's already happening. We are very much talking about the future, what should happen, uh, how we should reform systems, how we should change legislation, but in the same time the tools we have right now are not enough. And that should be the question. And in the same time, the tools that we create, the filtering mechanism, they are somehow limiting us as citizens. So for hardware, it's good to have security by design. For the online world, to have everything filtered by design might be a challenge. So these things somehow move fast, but still too slow. I don't really have the answers, but I'm still complaining in a way as a civil society person that the tools we have available right now are not effective, and even though we have a um, judicial system, they are still using the old ways to do it. So when we are dealing with hate speech or dis uh, disinformation or fake news in the online world, we don't have the tool right now. When we are facing with a uh, situation when a robot or an AI system is messing with our rights or our privacy, we don't have a tool right now you know, to change it, even though we are affected very fast. We still depend on business or other stakeholders to have a proactive role. And it's good to have that, but then it's also good to be really protected. That's what it means to have a right. A right means to be respected and enforced in the same time. You have access to that. And that's my reflection on it. I took advantage that Natalia was in the room, so at least <laughs> I can have the civil society role. But then uh, I can also move to, to the other questions. Um, in the back, and then if there are, okay, a second question. So in the back first. Okay. Uh, Liliana petsova Ilieska, Impetus Center for Internet Development and Good Governance. So I would reflect to your um, previous uh, talks, and yes, security by design, but 
uh, we're speaking also privacy by design. So I'm, I'm kind of confused here because you've mentioned, and this is spe specifically a question to the Council of Europe representative, um, you mentioned exotic solutions as, uh, yeah, the DPA from, from Georgia in times of where we want to build trust and security, but trustworthiness of the institutions and the system in the country. And that is very specific, let's say, national or environmental or contextual solution for the time being. And somehow um, it is kind of solution, but we haven't seen the reflections and the best practices of it in uh, these years. So basically, um, this is the question would be, and the question of the panel is very governmental, how to ensure trust and security, but I would add, what's the privacy uh, reflection here, and what is the future of privacy, specifically in terms when the Council of Europe this week has been negotiating and discussing the Convention 108 with the US. So what's in it for us, or, or what's in it for the US? For, of the global data protection regulation that it is imposing on us. I mean, GDPR, okay, fine, uh, that's European Union. Uh, we are Council of Europe members, uh, candidate countries, uh, as well for the European Union, but basically, the future of privacy in this global data protection system, what it is, and can we say that in a couple of years we'll uh, discuss on how to ensure privacy instead of trust and security. Thank you. Thank you, Liliana. In the back. Hi. Uh, I'm Tanya Pavleska. I come from Slovenia, from a research institute, uh, but I'm also a project coordinator of some uh, policy and technical related um, project. So I was going to give a remark that the technical aspect is completely missing, but luckily uh, Natalia came later. But anyway, it's still missing, especially in the debate, because usually when we approach the problems from technical perspective, we are stuck on the technical details, lacking to see the high level purpose in terms of how is this going to reflect in the uh, policy uh, world, in the um, lawmaking world, in the social context in general. And on the other hand, when we approach it from only policy aspect and uh, governmental aspect or the social aspect, we like to see what are the technical possibilities to even implement what we are imagining that we should have. So um, one remark is that the technical aspect is really important, but not just to reflect on the general technical issues, but really on the possibilities in terms of what is possible and in terms of what what can be made true by technology. Uh, and another, which is, I think, more important remark is that I miss the debate on what type of trust are we talking about. I mean, trust is, there are lots of levels of trust and lots of types of trust. Trust between individuals, for example, is emergent. You cannot regulate it. You cannot put rules on how it should be established. Trust in institutions is another thing, and you have to have rules there. So what is the trust that we're talking about? And while Liliana said that the privacy is questioned, you cannot have privacy if you don't trust the systems, if you don't trust the devices, if you don't trust the people that are behind the devices. So trust and security go together with privacy. Like, I don't think you can, uh, you can put lines between them and just take them apart from each other, they go together. So my question is, where is the risk management part? What comes if trust is not, or is broken? And it goes right to the first question from the gentleman that said, now he has proofs, but what should he do? And then Gori said, well, you, you, one should not put, put too much trust. Can you really say that? Is there such thing like, is trust too much, too little, or is it there or it's not there? Thank you. Well, there are definitely two completing, uh, complementing questions, if there is anything else. 
Otherwise, well, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry we don't have anyone else for, from the technical community, but if someone wants to take uh, an answer to, to this very particular point, I would be happy to give the floor to. So first reactions in the panel. Um, let me start because I think there's a couple of questions were directed straight to the Council of Europe uh, I'm here presenting it. Uh, unfortunately, I can only speak for, for the community which is dealing with cybercrime, so I'm not really in the type of community that deals with Convention 108, but I'll try to, to put it into perspective, nevertheless, uh, at least from a personal perspective. Um, anyways, um, when we say security and privacy, for me at least, I mean, these this concepts are not interchangeable, but they're very closely related. Uh, if you want to uh, comply with, let's say, the latest rules of information security, be it ISO or, or other standards, basically, security by design means also compliance with all the regulations that are there, including the, the privacy of, of users, privacy of citizens, so it's kind of built in there, so I wouldn't exclude it or just I mean, not uh, put these concepts against each other. For me, the privacy means also protection of, of personal data, because that's at least a part of the, of the, of the package of the, of the obligations of uh, that organization has or the government entity or whoever implements the security policies. Uh, there was also a mention of some exotic solutions and the trust in general and I think in here we can enter into very um, sort of complicated debate what trust is about in terms of regulation as such. So for example as a lawyer uh, you would see that for example the strong rules like those red lines that tell you don't do that, or if you do that, you're going to be punished for that, is exactly applicable in situations when there is no trust between the parties. Let's say trust between the citizens, because this is why we have the criminal law. Let's say the trust between the governments, because this is why we have public international law with very clear, for example, lines drawn in terms of, let's say, nuclear proliferation, international security, and those. And then for the other situations when some trust can be found, or it could be sort of based on a consensus, we have softer law, which is standards, let's say, could be, uh, for example, standards of a Council of Europe for cooperation between the law enforcement and internet service providers that find their way in memorandum of cooperation that are actually binding on the parties but still don't come from the law. So I wouldn't, again, say that it's, it's, it's a matter of uh, uh, trust uh, which is um, different. I think that the question of trust is really depends, again, on the context. So, for example, when talking about the criminal justice, uh, a response to, to uh, problems of cyberspace, the cybercrime uh, and electronic evidence. Primarily what we've, dealing be, what we've been dealing with for years is trust between the law enforcement on one side and the internet community on the other. So internet service providers to be more specific because they provide uh, access to data or potential evidence uh, that is happening on their network. So for us it's very important to, to ensure that that link is working. But it's also working in a balanced way. So, because it's, uh, it's also equally important to, to protect the rights of the citizens in there because uh, the obligations of privacy are also reflected, for example, an obligation of confidentiality of users for the internet service providers that could be monitored, let's say, by regulatory bodies. So you can have one more actor actually stepping in in terms of protection, not just the data protection authorities. It could be. It could take some different forms as well. So, uh, and the final, the final question was about. I think uh, uh, do not put too much trust into something. I think it also came with a disclaimer from my side that I really don't want to undermine any trust in anyone, including the judiciary as well. But sometimes the situations are there when you have to search for alternative or additional solutions in there. Because uh, the traditional solutions when they come to criminal justice in terms of, again, judicial oversight may not work due to the nature of electronic evidence and to the due to the nature of how the data is being processed or how those judicial, let's say, decisions are being implemented in practice because a lot of details are very important there in terms of, for example, when did the interception start against which number of users against I mean, how it was being conducted, when it has stopped, etc. what kind of data was uh, uh, taken from there. Was actually the data that was taken as a part of interception proportional to, to the uh, actual uh, decision or the actual uh, merits of the criminal case? So these are all difficult questions to which the judiciary does not or may not have always the answer. So this is why an exotic solution in Georgia was to call in the data protection inspector to look into those details. But those do not substitute the judicial powers. The judiciary power still apply. But this is an additional layer that just looks into the technical implementation of, of, uh, of the decision. So I guess, again, there are no uh, easy made answers to, to, to those questions, especially if we're talking about the trust. But 
I think that, uh, again, putting everything into context really, really matters. And I'm talking only and specifically about cybercrime. I'm not actually referring to cybersecurity, which is totally different, at least in my opinion, uh, level of regulation there. Thank you. Uh, any other reactions? And I think Natalia wants to answer, so at, least, at least on the technical and trust issue. Yeah, we we yes. don't have representative of industries, but I think we can, we can say also on behalf of the industries that industries are, should be, and I think they are those who are responsible, interested to establish a trust, uh, uh, trust with the, with the consumers, with, with, with the users. And trust goes with, uh, I would say, predictability, behavior. We have the legislation not to educate, just to prevent those uh, uh, misbehavior. But otherwise, we have to work with, uh, with all layers, so to establish a trustworthy and rules-based, uh, as we said, rules-based society, rules-based uh, cyberspace, so that my behavior and my rights will not violate your rights, so that we are having this predictability, and then we can grow on the, on the trust. This is the only way. I, I would say there are some parallels when, when uh, there was uh, first uh, traffic introduced, when the first cars came to the roads. There were no rules, I mean, they were just going, and then uh, link can uh, 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 function smoothly. And I think this is some kind of a, also a parallel. Of course, it's an ideal situation, maybe it, uh, it won't be achieved uh, over the night, but this is the road we are all, I think, uh, trying to move on. Well, uh, it's indeed a, a difficult question to answer. Uh, privacy and security go together really, and we need uh, to really intermix them. We need privacy by design, as it's stated by the GDPR uh, within the European framework, and security by design. But we also need to restore trust in the institutions protecting us, data protection authorities, uh, government more broadly, and even civil society and technical communities. Um, I'm going back yet again to the need for education when you know how it works, you better understand how to be protected, you better understand the steps in order really to, to improve your protection and to improve collaborative cybersecurity. Uh, as it concerns technical trust or technical measure, well, we most likely need to implement them as standards to have trust by design, if I may say, or ethics, if it's meaning, anything by design also, um, particularly uh, as it concerns emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence and so on, because obviously machine learning can be quite tricky in the mix. We have bodies, we have uh, experts, for example, uh, just to mention, but my colleagues maybe will reflect on the point from IETF working on this topic at the protocol and uh, technical level and embedding directly uh, privacy, security and trust in standards can be uh, obviously a, a way to go. Talia? Okay. Uh, thank you, Veronica. And um, I would not add anything uh, on top of what was said by the panelists. I think these were quite strong messages calling for uh, how to achieve trust and uh, security. And as we are running uh, a bit over time of our can session, I, I, I would give the floor to Andriana. She's kindly taking notes of the uh, of, of this session to make some uh, closing uh, messages and remarks uh, for uh, to to resume uh, uh, this this panel. Andriana. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. I am Andriana from Diplo Foundation. So <clears throat> I'm going to read the messages from this session. As you know, they are main takeaways and recommendations on how Southeastern Europe and the neighboring area could take better advantage of the opportunities after offered by digital technologies. Now, the way this works, I'm going to read the message, and I will leave you about a minute to tell me if you agree or if you disagree. There will be no discussion about it, just tell me yes or no. Does that sound okay? Yes, no? Okay. All right. To improve cybersecurity, we need more engagement, excellence, more experts regarding digital health, and more money invested. 
Does that sound okay? Uh, okay, the second one is security by mindset is needed for which we need improved cyber hygiene. This can be achieved by education and capacity building via IT classes, coding classes, cyber hygiene curricula from young age. Uh, EU cyber dialogue should consider bringing in uh, regional processes like CEDIC. CEDIC can play an intermediary role and help exchange good practices. That will be it. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana, for taking notes of the panel uh, and uh, uh, making these uh, closing remarks. And uh, I would uh, give back to uh, Veronica for the final uh, resuming of the session, uh, Veronica. Thank you. Um, we had the hand <laughs> yeah. a bit um, before. Yeah, please, use yeah, the mic. Can I uh, give a reply for the technical parts? Uh, you know, we talked about privacy, but we didn't talk about any technical aspects. So what I would like to say is we didn't talk, uh, for example, Richard Stallman says that in order to get privacy, we need uh, open source software. So we need free software. So as, as I uh, would like to add, uh, we cannot talk about any privacy if we don't see the code it te uh, when we talk about the technical aspects. So for uh, privacy, we should talk more about Linux. We should talk uh, more about open source software. And what I would like to add is we should talk about decentralized internet because the internet is not decentralized anymore. We should talk about blockchain and derivative implementations. We should work on it. Uh, and we should, uh, what I would like to add is, uh, for example, for DNS attacks or other things, uh, we should talk more. I, I don't want to use too much time, so that's it. Thank you. Point taken. Uh, I will uh, use the time also to mention this is just the beginning of the CED. So we have basically two full days to debate this in formal spaces and informal spaces. Thank you for all the points made. Thank you for all the comments and input. Uh, thank you for um, the final key points that we will take further because this, all, this is always a process. CED is part of something bigger and these messages will be carried through. Um, with this in mind, I think we can close this part uh, of the panel. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the support. Uh, thank you to Natalia for preparing the session. I was just here on the stage. Thank you to uh, Sorina and Dushan for uh, organizing the CED. Thank you all here and from the Romanian side and from the State Secretary side. I'd like to invite you here again if you care to join us uh, between 13th and 14th of June when Romania will host the Digital Assembly, which is the biggest European event, and will be just after the elections and just before a new European Commission starts, when a new plan, a new agenda is set on the table, and that will be a key moment to see how many of these ideas can uh, uh, get in a better shape and uh, bring, uh, be brought to life quite soon. Thank you so much, and let's have a great discussion in the next two days. Thank you. <laughs>